right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Steph Weber, who is in Indianapolis, Indiana. How are you doing, Steph? I am doing wonderful, John. Thank you so much for having me. I, I am excited to be here with you as well. Fantastic. And and Steph is uh, is the CEO of the uh, the Weber company. Um, she looks after and helps build brand and helps people build brands that are flourish and have great brand authority and and can really really communicate what you need to communicate to your to your people. And she has a great uh, team of people behind her. And that's kind of what we want to talk about today: is the foundations of being an authority brand. Because Steph, I still feel today that people still don't really understand the comprehensive nature of brand. You know, a lot of people still look at it. It's the logo and it's the the pretty colors and it's the nice fancy slogan that we came up with. But first of all, just to bottom line it for people, explain what brand is and what brand isn't. Yeah, absolutely. So the brand is the perception in the market that your audience has of you, of your business, of your company as a whole. I think oftentimes I get the question of what's the difference between branding and marketing? And so I like to explain that the brand is the perception. It is the human connection, is the emotional piece. It is ultimately the reason that people are saying yes to you. Your marketing strategy, the marketing tactics, your efforts that you're making from a marketing perspective are how you are sharing that brand message across a multitude of platforms to bring new members into your audience, into your ecosystem to allow them to convert. But ultimately, the reason that they're converting and saying yes to you is largely due to your brand. Yeah. And the brand is that in, is something that everybody in the organization needs to understand and be able mm -hmm. to support and articulate. Because I think that's another big area where it falls down, Steph, is that uh, you may have a, you may come up with the concept for a great brand. Maybe it's presented really well by some people in your company, but some people in your company don't really understand it, don't know what they're doing. So the brand experience for different types of, of people who interact with you can be different, which is not what you want. Yeah, that's very true. And it's funny that you brought that up too, John. I was just having a conversation this morning with a potential client. We were talking about past work experiences and toxic, unfortunately, toxic work environments. And it very much is your brand as a whole, not just your brand in terms of what you're putting out on social media, but it's also your brand internally within your internal company culture as well, that your team needs to have buy-in as well as your clients do. And ultimately you're the one that is guiding that vision for the brand as a whole yeah absolutely so how do you go about starting to build a brand that has some authority that has some real equ equity to it mm -hmm. well i want to start first john by helping your audience understand what it actually means to be an authority brand so the first kind of Perfect. identifier for us here at the weber co being an authority brand means that you stand in your power. You know with full confidence that you bring something meaningful and impactful to the table. There are many others in your industry who do what you do. You know, all of us experience saturation in our industries, but none of them are going to do it quite the way that you do, leaning back into that brand experience. That's why this is so important. And it is truly up to you to identify the gaps and to fill them in your own unique way. Being an authority brand also means that you show up ready to make an impact for your life and for the lives of others. Listen, we define vision and impact in, in a few different levels at the Weber Co. And one of those is from a personal impact. So what is your brand allowing you to do and how is that allowing you to live in your definition of success? How are you impacting the lives of others, the lives of those that your business exists to serve in a very powerful way? And what is your pay it forward impact? How are you ultimately giving back to your community to a purpose that is larger and greater and outside of you. You know, we we really embody this idea of impact on these multitude of levels because wanting for yourself is not selfish, but your business also exists to do something that's outside of you as well. So that that is a piece of an authority brand. Um, being an authority brand also means that you stand in your beliefs and your values. You allow your vision and who you are at your core ultimately to be able to drive you and get the business and get yourself to where it is that you want to go. And ultimately, you are also innovative. So you take some foundational principles, you implement them in your own unique way, or you do something that is against the status quo. Being an authority in your industry requires you to go against the grain sometimes. You don't have to mm -hmm. accept the idea that something has to be done a certain way because it's always been done that way. And it's okay to kind of disrupt. And we, we're here for those disruptor moments. 
And lastly, I want to point out that being an authority brand means that you take responsibility and ownership for your actions. You know, I think it's very easy as the CEO of a company sometimes to want to blame outside circumstances. Or I see this a lot, especially in the social media world of, oh, the algorithm today didn't show my post. And it's like, all right, guys, (laughs) we really need to take ownership for what it is that we are doing on a daily and consistent basis to ultimately reach our vision. So those are a few of the key indicators for what being an authority brand kind of looks like for us. Um, and that kind of leads us into those foundational pieces. Yeah, no, that, that was fantastic. That was really useful. Yeah, it, it's so important that people do understand the, like the role that they do play uh, in supporting a brand. And, and like you said, is understanding the, the values and the culture of the company. And these can't just be bumper stickers. They have to be something real. And and as you said, I mean, if you if you can't, if you're not enthusiastic, it doesn't matter what you do in the company, if you're not enthusiastic about the brand and the vision and what you do and helping people, change, you're never going to be able to communicate that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's very, that's very true. And, you know, it's interesting too, John, when I brought in my team members, um, they had all had various different work experience with some with entrepreneurs, some in corporate, you know, a, kind of a well-rounded experience of backgrounds on our team, which is really cool. But many of them started and said, wow, I've never seen a brand document quite like this that really goes into the depth of what your company exists to do and the messaging in and around that. And it really guides how we are speaking with those who are in our ecosystem, be they community members, clients, whatever it may be, because there's a there are brand experiences that our customers are having before they even become customers that have to be very clearly defined and set out with intention by yourself as a CEO, but also by your team members. So yes, very interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I think I think that's so fundamental. And I think that's a thing that many people overlook. And to be honest, I mean, a lot of people, they, here's the other thing, uh, before we just get into building the building the uh, foundation is mm-hmm. that your brand, your brand is not a static thing either, it can change over time. I mean, look, we've seen many, ex, 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 uh, many examples of brands that once stood for one thing, and now kind of stand for another. So it's something that you always have to be conscious of, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it absolutely is. And you know, our our world is evolving and we as human beings are growing year after year. I mean, where my brand started in 2016 to where it is now looks very different in some capacities. In other capacities, I am who I am at my core. I'm very loyal. I like to trust people. People trust me. Um, I like to teach on branding and marketing. These are things I've been doing since 2016, but the way in which I've been doing them has evolved over time. Your brand has to give you that space and that flexibility. And that's the power behind having a really solid brand foundation is that when you have that set up, it makes it that much easier to pivot and to allow your audience to pivot and grow with you, which is really important. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So what are some of what are some of the key uh, elements of an authority brand? What are the foundational elements that you need to put in place? Yep. So we have three fundamentals for establishing your authority brand. And then within these three fundamentals, there are various different pieces underneath. So I'll kind of give you the overview and then we can dive Mm -hmm. in a little bit deeper to each of these. So the first piece is your foundation, your brand foundations. The second piece is going to be your brand identity. And the third piece is going to be your overall brand experience. So these are the three fundamentals for really establishing an authority brand in the space. John, would you like me to dive into these a little bit deeper? Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, absolutely. So the first piece is the, are those brand foundations. So this is going to be your mission, your vision, your core values, your positioning statement, your differentiating factors, and your brand promise. So your mission and your vision and your core values, probably three things that you've heard of as an entrepreneur. Yes, you need to mm-hmm. have these pieces. But what you really need to understand about these pieces is how they impact your brand as a whole. Your mission is ultimately guiding your day-to-day decision-making. It's guiding your day-to-day action in your business. And this matters for not only you, but for your team and for your clients. And when your clients are buying into your business, they're also buying into your mission and your vision and those core values. So you want to be sure that those are clearly communicated across the board so that anyone who decides to do business with you knows what you stand for. And that is clearly demonstrated through your mission, your vision, and your core values. The positioning statement piece of this is simply, how are you doing something a little bit different in your market? In other words, what corner are you claiming in your market that's different than what else exists out there? So how are you positioning yourself? I like to use the example here of um, bounty paper towels. So if Mm -hmm. you've seen the commercial, you'll often see like, 
bounty and it picks the mess up really easily. And it's like such a nice experience for the user and then like leading competitor. And it's like the paper towel is like falling apart as they're trying to wipe mm -hmm. up a mess. They're positioning themselves based on the quality of their product. So there are various different ways in which you can position yourself and claim your corner of the market, but it's important for you as the brand to identify what that looks like for you. Then of course you have your differentiating factors. So what are those pieces that are different? This could be through your brand experience. This could be the way in which you speak to your customers or clients. This could be the welcome gifts that you send out. What are the things that you do that are kind of rolling out the red carpet or that create that elevated experience for your right. community or your clients? And then you've got your mm -hmm. brand promise. So it's, what are you promising to your people at the end of the day? They're saying yes to you. What's the promise on the other side of that? And then you have your identity and your experience are, are kind of those second buckets. So the identity is really how your brand sounds, those key words and phrases, how you're making people feel on the other side of a message from you, how your brand actually looks. So yes, your fonts, logos, and colors do matter here in this identity piece. The identity piece also is really how are you getting your team on board with your brand voice as a whole mm. as you're growing and scaling too. And then the last piece here, this third fundamental is your overall brand experience. We want to make sure that we define the brand experience from the time that someone connects with you on social media to the time that they say yes as a client to the time that they start referring their friends and family or their their ecosystem to you yeah. because of the experience they've had with you. So making sure that you define that across the board. Yeah, and I know there's a lot of things to unpack there, but the, the uh -huh. last one that you mentioned, you just mentioned there is 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 critically important, and that is uh, you know that it's shared, you know that that is shared across the whole company and people really understand it and people can can um, really articulate it because as you said the continuum of the customer experience is like pre even meeting or seeing you um, their first interactions with the brand all the way through to as you say hopefully when they become long-term customers and referrals but the, the only the challenge with that and what a lot of companies are facing into the challenge with that is one mistake along that continuum unfortunately can color the whole experience because that's what we're like as human beings you know we don't remember the i was i always use the airline example right you can check in is smooth uh, getting on is smooth flight leaves on time flight is fantastic everything is good you land even you land a couple of minutes early and then your baggage is delayed but they don't but there's nobody around to tell you why Mm -hmm. Right. So now mm -hmm. your positive experience hinges on a negative. And who, what do we do? Somebody asks you, how was your journey? Terrible. Mm -hmm. Even though it was only the last, <laughs> even though it was only the last bit of it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I, and I have been that person to lose my luggage. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. absolutely true. We, because again, human nature, we cling on to that negative piece of what has just happened for us and traveling in, in and of itself, sometimes being a stressful experience in, mm -hmm. in many cases, and especially when you lose that luggage, it's like, wow, the whole trip was great until this moment. And now the negative piece is what I remember. And so it's thinking, you know, using that as kind of the example here, what is the customer journey or the customer continuum from start to finish to the time that they're referring, right? So that person is probably not referring to whatever airline that they just flew because of the yeah. baggage situation, right? That's a problem as a brand. Yeah, and now and a, and a simple fix. If there was somebody there who was informing people, then you're going, okay, I understand what's going on. And the other part I think is really important, and Steph, is that this is what customers hate, right? It's the handoffs, right? Yeah. It's I start off working with you as a say, maybe as a salesperson, and then you know I decide to buy, and suddenly I'm handed off to, you know, customer success, and maybe they're fine, but there's. But there's always that sense that you're being passed along from one person to another and you don't get that sometimes you don't get that sense of uh, security if you like or, or you know you think there's going to be potential issues you don't think you're as important anymore there's a lot of things happened in handoffs and i think that's a bit that that still is people are really falling down on and don't realize that that's part of your brand experience mm -hmm. yeah it absolutely is and and typically in companies especially companies that are growing you are going to be handed off at some point. I like to I like to remind companies who do have teams and who are scaling in that way that you as a CEO are responsible for helping your team engineer their celebrity and their own brand, crafting their own brand within your brand. And that is a tricky process. But, you know, we have we have several team members. One of our team members, her name is Narvis, and she is our client success strategist. So she works directly with our clients from 
a strategy perspective, from an accountability perspective. She's very hands on with them. And so if they've had a sales call with me or they've had a sales call with a number, another member of our team, when they go to Narvis, they have an onboarding call with her and with myself or with, mm -hmm. ju with just Narvis, but it has been very clearly demonstrated to them what Narvis's celebrity is within the Weber Co and where her zone of genius is within our brand as a whole. And that's demonstrated too through Narvis's branded Weber Co social media account also. So we're strategic in how we do this within our company because it's, it is part of the overall experience and no one likes to feel <laughs> feel like they've just been like brought into something and now all of a sudden something else is happening and there there can be a lack of trust that happens at that moment and that's tricky. And, and, and you just brought up another kind of fascinating uh, issue. And this, this was an issue, I think, that even started back, uh, you know, kind of started with LinkedIn and that about uh, when people were starting to say, well, no, that's my personal, that's my personal LinkedIn, that's got nothing to do with the company, or that's my personal thing. The fact is what you're saying is building up their, their celebrity, their, their area of expertise, really pushing that. I think that a lot of organizations don't do that because they're still stuck in sort of semi hierarchical structures or they haven't, they haven't evolved to the point where they're saying this actually gives great comfort. This is a selling point. This is a point of differentiation. You mm -hmm. want to, you want them to go, well, you know, Steph was great on the sale, but boy, Narvis is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And as a CEO, you're responsible for helping your, I mean, Narvis wouldn't have, would not have been able to come into the Weber Co and create a Weber Co branded account that demonstrates her zone of genius, right? When she's on her account, she's talking about how she coaches clients. She's talking about the wins that her clients are sharing with her. Yes, it is through the Weber Co, but that's Narvis's, like that is her mm -hmm. area to own and claim in our company. And that's powerful. So as a CEO, I give ownership to Narvis of her position. And I think that that's what we're not seeing happen in a lot of companies, John, is that they're simply clinging on to this kind of hierarchical thing. And, and that's fine. I, I get that to an extent. However, if you want your company to grow and to have success, you have to understand that we live in a world that prioritizes human connection and human connection equals trust. If the consumers yep. on the other side don't feel that they can trust the brand they're doing business with and don't feel like they are going to be loyal to them or have their best interest at heart, of course, they're not saying yes, or they're getting in and then going, this isn't what I signed on for. This, there's a disconnect here. And that's a brand problem. Yeah. And I, and I just love that idea. I love that idea of building people up, as I said, because it's it's not typically done by a lot of organizations. Because some organizations will go, well, well, if I build them up and if I really help them and give them ownership and let them promote themselves, well, then they'll they just promote themselves into a job somewhere else, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and we used to always have that. I was in, in the sales training industry for a while, but we used to have the same argument. People say, well, what happens if I train my salespeople and they leave? And you could say, but what happens if you don't train them and they stay? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now you have a bunch of untrained salespeople. Wouldn't it be better risk uh, to have highly trained ones? And maybe if somebody moves on, so what? But I think I do think there are, these are the things that sometimes hold people back. Is like they they don't want to sort of promote people who they perceive maybe at a different point in the organization, or they think, well, why is that person you know kind of self promoting over there? And these are the kind of things we have to get away from because that's just the world we live in. Yes, it, it, it absolutely is. And along with that comes guidelines and comes an understanding and also comes the buy-in from the team. My entire team mm -hmm. is bought into the Weber Co vision because of the brand that we have built. But within that, they also get ownership of their own visions. You know, I'm not, I'm not dumbfounded by the fact that they are here so that they can have their own dreams and live life in a, it, on their terms, right? They want to have their apartment in LA and still be able to live and go to the beach when they want to go to the beach. They want to be able to take their daughter on vacation somewhere she's never been before. I know that this job is supporting that. And in order for it to continue to do so, continue to do that, we also have to bring new clients into our ecosystem and doing that and allowing the company to grow in that way, they have to be able to stand on their own as kind of their own brand within ours as well, with my support, with my help, with my guidance, but they have to be bought into our vision as a whole. And if they're not, they probably are going to leave. And for me, you know, the on the development side, my team gets access to a plethora of resources. If anyone on my team wanted to leave and go and start their own business, they very much could. But they're here at the Weber Co because they believe in the vision that we are cultivating together as a united front, as a team. And that's very powerful. So 
again, it all comes back to the brand, right? And having that authority in your space and, and claiming that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, this, this has been fantastic, Steph. I mean, the time has flown. All of Steph's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and, and the Weber Co. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would love to connect with you first. So if you are on Instagram, that is the place where I hang out most often. So you can come and join us at the Weber Co on Instagram. Um, we do also have multiple different workshops that we host throughout the year. So you can hear about those on Instagram or you can head over to the WeberCo.com to see the latest on what is happening. And we just look really forward to being able to connect with you. Fantastic. And then, uh, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Um, don't forget to comment. We love comments. Uh, and let's see what uh, I'm sure Steph would love to hear back from you as well. And share and share with your friends and colleagues. Well, listen, Steph, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again really soon. Thank you.